Good afternoon. We have just uh, finished an extraordinary meeting of NATO defense ministers focused on the consequences of Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine. We addressed our support uh, for Ukraine, the severe costs we are imposing on Russia, and NATO's work to strengthen our defenses uh, now and for the years to come. Our close partners Finland, Sweden and Georgia and the European Union joined us for the first session. And Ukrainian Defense Minister Oleksiy Resnikov described in stark terms the death and destruction caused by President Putin's war. The determined resistance of the Ukrainians against the invasion and the importance of our continued support. We all paid tribute to the courage of uh, the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian armed forces. NATO allies and partners have supported Ukraine with equipment and training for many years. We are helping Ukraine to uphold its fundamental right to self-defense, freedom and democracy with significant amounts of critical military equipment. Today, ministers agreed that we must continue to provide significant support to Ukraine, including with uh, military supplies, financial help and humanitarian aid. NATO allies and partners are also hosting millions of Ukrainian refugees. President Putin must stop this war immediately, withdraw his forces now, and engage in diplomacy in good faith. NATO is responding to this crisis with speed and unity, and next week, Allied heads of state and government will meet for an extraordinary NATO summit. We will address both our immediate response and the changes we need to make for our longer term security. Moscow should be in no doubt. NATO will not tolerate any attack on Allied sovereignty or territorial integrity. We have already activated our defense plans to shield the alliance, increase our readiness and deploy troops uh, from both sides of the Atlantic. There are now hundreds of thousands of forces at heightened alert across the alliance. 100,000 US troops in Europe and around 40,000 troops under direct NATO command, mostly in the eastern part of the alliance. Backed by major air and naval power, as well as air defenses. But we face a new reality for our security. So we must reset our collective defense and deterrence for the longer term. Today, we tasked our military commanders to develop options across all domains, land, air, sea, cyber and space. On land, our new posture should include substantially more forces in the eastern part of the alliance at higher readiness, with more pre-positioned equipment and supplies. In the air, more allied air power and strengthened integrated air and missile defense. At sea, carrier strike groups, submarines and significant numbers of combat ships on persistent basis. We will also consider the future of our cyber defenses and how best to draw on allied space assets. We should also train and exercise more often and in greater numbers. Major increases to our deterrence and defense 
will require major investments. Allies need to invest a minimum of 2% of GDP on defense. And I welcome that allies such as Germany and Denmark have already made important announcements on more investments and faster timetables. We also need to spend more together. NATO common funding is the essential enabler that allows us to work together. It is a force multiplier for national defense efforts, and it shows solidarity as allies. At this critical moment for our security, unity between North America and Europe in NATO is more important than ever. And with that, I'm ready to take your questions. Okay, we'll start with BBC in the center, just behind. Last row. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Secretary General. Um, could I just ask you, uh, we've heard once again from President Zelensky addressing US Congress, calling for a no-fly zone. Are there any allies at all who have been asking for one, uh, even if the decision of the alliance as a whole is not to enforce one? Has there been any discussion at all about it? And the second question I have is just about... Uh, Ukraine and its NATO membership, do you believe that NATO, sorry, Ukraine has cooled towards its view of joining NATO as a negotiating tool with the hope of eventually reaching some kind of agreement with Russia? Thank you very much. Allies are united, both in providing support to Ukraine, to support Ukraine to uphold the right for self-defense, but allies are also united uh, when it comes to that, NATO should not deploy forces on the ground or in the airspace of Ukraine. Because we have a responsibility to ensure that this uh, conflict, this war, doesn't escalate beyond Ukraine. We see death, we see destruction, we see human suffering in Ukraine, but this can become even worse if NATO uh, took actions that actually turned it in, in, this into a full-fledged war between uh, NATO and, uh, and Russia. So allies are united uh, when it comes to the issue of uh, how to provide support uh, to Ukraine. Uh, ministers addressed this today. They reinforced the message of the importance of providing support uh, with uh, equipment, advanced equipment, air defense systems, uh, anti-tank uh, weapons, and many other types of support but no NATO uh, deployment of uh, air or ground uh, capabilities uh, in Ukraine, and that's the united uh, position from NATO allies. Then, um, then uh, the message to Ukraine uh, is the same now as it has been for years, that uh, Ukraine is a sovereign, independent nation. It has its own right to choose its own path, and we, res we respect the decisions made by the democratic elected government by Ukraine. So it's up, for, up for, it's up to them to decide whether they aspire for NATO membership or not, and then it's up for 30 allies to decide uh, on that issue, uh, 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 not, no, not for Russia to try to veto such a process. CNN. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General, Natasha Bertram, CNN. I'm wondering whether NATO has invited President Zelensky to participate in any way in the Leaders' Summit next week, as Resnikov did in the Defense Ministerial today. And I'm also wondering if you could respond to um, the Polish proposal to send NATO forces into Ukraine on a so-called peacekeeping mission. Thanks. As what we need is peace in Ukraine, uh, and therefore Russia and President Putin has to stop the war, withdraw its forces. Uh, we support all efforts to find a negotiated uh, solution. We support all efforts to find a diplomatic solution. And of course, we support and welcome the, the talks and negotiations which are now taking place between Ukraine and, uh, and Russia. Uh, at the same time, we support Ukraine because we know what they can achieve on the negotiating table is, of course, very closely linked to the situation on the battlefield. So uh, I strongly also believe that one of the reasons why uh, 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 the Ukrainians also are saying that they have seen some uh, 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 steps in the right direction is because they have been able to fight back. They have been able to 
uh, 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 fight back uh, against the invading Russian forces. So the courage, the determination, and the support from NATO allies to the Ukrainian armed forces uh, is extremely important also when it comes to what they can achieve as part of the negotiated uh, process with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Russia. Um, so uh, again, uh, of course, we support peace efforts. We, we, we call on Russia to, and President Putin to withdraw its forces, but we have no plans of deploying NATO troops uh, on the ground in, um, in, uh, in Ukraine. Okay, we have uh, Rai. Secretary General, Odilo, uh, can you comment on Italy's role in this current crisis? And uh, happy birthday for today. Thank you. Uh, I, um, I would very much like to comment on Italy's role. Uh, Italy is a highly valued uh, NATO ally, a founding member, and Italy is contributing to our collective defense in many different ways. I was uh, recently in Romania. I uh, met uh, uh, Italian pilots. They are helping there to uh, keep uh, uh, NATO airspace safe, and, uh, and, they, and, they, uh, and they really uh, show commitment and, uh, and, uh, and strength in their contributions to uh, different NATO missions and operations, including in Kosovo, uh, where Italy has been a key uh, ally for many, many years. Financial Times. Yeah, gentleman with glasses. Yeah. Thank you. Just to follow up to the question about the peace talks, you said that you're, enc you're encouraged by signs and that you support any effort to find a diplomatic solution. Could you tell us, are you seeing any signs on the ground that the Russians are genuine uh, in their approach to these peace talks or that they may well just be using them as a distraction uh, for resupply and for uh, restructuring their approach? Thank you. On the ground, we don't see any sign. Uh, and that's the reason why we also call on Russia to engage in these talks in good faith. And it's not for me to report uh, uh, from these talks. NATO are not part of those talks. These are talks between Ukraine and Russia. But I've just seen the reports coming out from those talks. Uh, I think it's a very important not, uh, not, to, not, uh, not to speculate and not to prejudge uh, or to preempt any outcome of these talks. Uh, but I, uh, my message was in a way that uh, it is obvious that what uh, Ukraine can achieve around the negotiating table is very closely linked to the situation on the battleground. And, uh, and therefore, the support we give to them uh, to uh, uh, stand up against and to resist the Russian uh, invasion also helps them uh, to achieve ex an acceptable outcome uh, in the uh, negotiations. Associated Press. Lauren Cook from the Associated Press. Could you tell me a little bit more about the, the tasking uh, that you've given NATO commanders, what that might involve? And are we, looking, are we looking ahead one year or are we talking about a decade, uh, something longer term? And you, you also use the word persistent. I, I wonder what that means. What, why wouldn't you say permanent, on a permanent basis? Well, the, that, that's the, this is the way we make these kind of decisions in NATO, is that uh, the, politi the politicians, they set out the guidelines, the direction, then we task our military commanders to give advice on how to follow up, and then we make final decisions as politicians based on these uh, 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 devices uh, and, and input from our military commanders. Um, this was exactly the same we did uh, back in 2016 when we at the Warsaw summit uh, made historic decisions for the first time in our history to deploy NATO combat troops to the eastern part of the lines. You have to remember that before Ukraine, also before uh, the illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014 by, uh, by Russia, NATO had no combat troops in the eastern part of the lines. Then we had the illegal annexation of Crimea. And since 2014, we have implemented the biggest reinforcement of collective defense since the end of the Cold War. Uh, tripling the size of the NATO response force, um, f establishing the battle groups in, in the Baltic countries and Poland, uh, more uh, presence in the air at sea, and of course also started to uh, invest more increasing defense spending. Then the process was the same. The politicians tasked the, the commanders, they provided advice, and based on that we developed uh, the final conclusions that uh, allied heads of state and government made at the summit in 2016. And then since then we have implemented that. I foresee a similar process now. We have tasked the military commanders 
uh, we will have their uh, advice uh, within uh, weeks. And then, and then uh, uh, my ambition is that uh, heads of state and government, when they meet at the end of June, can make the, the, the decisions on um, significantly increased uh, presence, uh, uh, reinforcing our uh, deterrence and defense um, on land, at sea, and in the air. Uh, and, uh, and of course, this will then depend on the input we get from the uh, commanders, but also, of course, uh, at the end of the day, it has to be a political uh, decision uh, by uh, the leaders. So the decision I foresee within months, as meaning uh, by the summit in June, then implementation will, of course, vary a bit depending on uh, what kind of decisions we are going to, uh, to make. Frankfurt Allgemeine, just behind, HB. Just behind. Thomas Kutschka, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. Secretary General, is there anything in the NATO-Russia Founding Act that could restrict military planners and commanders when they work out these options for leaders? Thank you. Well, so we will do what is necessary uh, to make sure that uh, uh, there is no room for misunderstanding in Moscow, to, for miscalculation uh, in Moscow about our commitment, readiness to protect and defend uh, all allies, every inch of NATO territory. And the reason why we do that is not to provoke a conflict, but is to prevent the conflict. That has been the success of NATO for more than 70 years, that uh, any potential ag aggressor or adversary has always known that an attack on, on one ally will trigger a response from the whole alliance. And to ensure that in a new security reality, we need, we need a reset of our deterrence and defense. And that's exactly what we're now tasking the commanders to provide advice on, how to reset our deterrence and defense, and we will do what is necessary. The, 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 the NATO-Russia uh, uh, founding treaty, of course, that actually has a clear reference to in the current security environment back in 1997. We are not in the current security environment today. We are in a total different security environment. At that stage, we actually foresaw Russia as a strategic partner working with them uh, since then, Russia has uh, invaded uh, Georgia, illegally annexed Crimea, uh, and, uh, and uh, now also invaded uh, Ukraine. So, uh, so we will do what is necessary, and uh, 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 the NATO-Russia founding act is not um, something that will uh, create problems or, or, or hindrance for uh, NATO to make the necessary decisions. Okay, we'll get to Ukrainian news agency. Dmitry uh, Shkurko, <clears throat> National News Agency of Ukraine. Um, there, in uh, negotiations with Russia, uh, is another important factor. According to the data released today uh, from the general staff of Ukraine, around 40% of invading forces already lost uh, by Russians in uh, equipment and manpower. Uh, could uh, NATO confirm that? And uh, because of that, the obvious question is uh, uh, the threaten uh, the, uh, the threat is, uh, which Russia poses to uh, NATO uh, in escalation a little bit uh, overestimated by uh, NATO countries. Thank you. President Putin totally underestimated the strength of the Ukrainian armed forces. He un he, President Putin underestimated the unity uh, of the Ukrainian people and the courage of the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian leadership. Uh, and this uh, uh, combined with the support, uh, the massive support uh, the Ukrainian armed forces are receiving and actually have received from NATO allied countries over many years, uh, have uh, forced uh, President Putin to change his plans and to, and to realize that this quick uh, uh, victory, uh, this blitzkrieg uh, taking uh, control over Kiev uh, within days has, has absolutely failed. But, but we should not underestimate Russia's uh, capabilities uh, when it comes to continue the war and also to continue to attack, uh, including uh, cities. We have seen how Russia has been responsible for the same, or for brutal warfare, uh, both in Chechnya, uh, but also in, in, uh, in Syria. And, um, and of course, um, even though they have uh, made uh, severe mistakes, uh, Russia maintain a large uh, capability of uh, conventional armed forces, but uh, you, you, uh, but uh, but um, but uh, uh, 
Russia, President Putin has also, um, so he, they have also used nuclear rhetoric. Uh, Russia is a nuclear power, uh, and uh, and uh, we have seen how they uh, have stepped up to also the nuclear rhetoric, uh, threatening uh, both uh, uh, NATO allies and uh, and Ukraine. So I think we uh, we must, must not underestimate uh, the dangers uh, related to the military capabilities of uh, Russia, including their will to actually use force and impose uh, devastation and destruction on others. Go to Imedi, lady in white line. Thank you very much, Joanna. Mr. Secretary General, can you tell us more about Georgia? Um, uh, Defense Minister from Georgia attended the ministerial, and you have, uh, and you said recently that it's a broad agreement that we need to do more to support Georgia. So, what uh, options uh, were discussed, for example, today? Thank you very much. I think we need to realize that uh, we are faced with a total new security reality which of course affects uh, the people of uh, Ukraine. It's devastating for them. Uh, but it's also uh, putting more pressure on uh, uh, also those countries in our neighborhood uh, who are uh, not members of NATO, not members of EU, countries at risk. Uh, and Georgia is one of them. And uh, the Georgian defense minister attended the meeting. Uh, all allies listened very carefully to his intervention. Uh, where he stated the, the, the challenges Georgia faces being a country which has already seen the consequences of aggressive actions by Russia back in 2008 and, uh, and uh, other attempts by Russia to, to, uh, to interfere uh, in uh, Georgian domestic affairs. Uh, so the message, one of the lessons we have to learn from what is going on in Ukraine today is that we need to support these countries which are at risk now it's better to support and help them now than after uh, uh, a military intervention. So, uh, if anything, I think uh, we now see the value of the support that has been provided to Ukraine before the invasion, but also the importance of that we could have done even more for Ukraine. And then I think that the message for Georgia is that we should step up, provide more support, uh, and send a message that uh, we support the territorial integrity and sovereignty of uh, uh, Georgia, not only in words, but also in deeds, and therefore I call on NATO allies and others to provide uh, support to uh, Georgia. And that was the message also from allied leaders at the meeting today. Al Jazeera. Secretary General, we're 21 days now into this conflict. Based on Russia's performance militarily so far and your current intelligence, can Russia win this war? I think we should all be careful speculating too much. Uh, what we have seen is uh, uh, a strength, uh, the strength and the courage and the, and the capabilities of the Ukrainian armed forces, which has impressed the whole world and uh, which has uh, been able to slow down, uh, to fight back against the invading uh, Russian uh, forces uh, and uh, uh, I pay tribute to the Ukrainian forces and the Ukrainian people in the way they have been able to stand up against the invasion. But at the same time, Russia remains a formidable military power. Uh, they have many different types of weapons, uh, and therefore I think it's too early uh, to speculate about the outcome. Uh, what we need is Russia to stop the war, President Putin to, to withdraw its troops, and then to find a political solution. Um, that's what I will say about that. Okay, we'll take a last question. Polish TV, lady in uh, black and white there. Thanks. I would like, uh, would like to go back to this uh, special summit of NATO uh, in upcoming week. Uh, could you say what is the special reason to organize this summit, especially that uh, on June we have a regular NATO summit? Uh, so could you tell us more about this? Thank you. President Putin has underestimated uh, Ukraine, the people of Ukraine and the armed forces of Ukraine and the political leadership of Ukraine. But President Putin has also underestimated NATO because we reacted swiftly and unified 
in a way that has imposed severe costs on Russia. Together with partners, the European Union, NATO allies have imposed unprecedented economic costs. We have provided and continue to provide essential support to the, to the Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, allies do that uh, every day. And we are uh, also increasing the presence of NATO in the eastern part of the lines. So, President Putin's aim was to divide NATO. What he gets is a more united NATO. He wanted to, in a way, to undermine the, 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 the nation of Ukraine. He's actually strengthening the, the unity of Ukraine and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the commitment to the Ukrainian nation by the Ukrainian people. And then he wanted less NATO on its borders. He's getting more NATO on its borders. So to do all this, we need to be coordinated. We need to consult. And therefore, we, uh, the day after invasion, we had a virtual uh, NATO summit with all the NATO leaders, extraordinary NATO uh, summit. And we will have an extraordinary NATO summit next week uh, uh, in person here in Brussels uh, to continue to ensure that we are united, that we are uh, closely aligned, and that we act together, both when it comes to providing support to Ukraine when it comes to coordinating our efforts, when it comes to imposing costs on uh, Russia, but also when it comes to taking the necessary decisions to ensure that we send a clear message to Russia about our credible deterrence and defense, both uh, in the short term, but also in the longer term, including by uh, starting the work to reset NATO's deterrence and defense. Thank you very much. We'll conclude this press conference. Thank you. Thank you.